Hey guys, welcome out this morning to Revolution. Um, the website that I run is called Texas Receptus. Uh, and if you type in tr.org.au, you'll be able to see um, articles that back up and defend the Texas Receptus and also that defend the King James Version. Now, I know there's a lot of kerfuffle um, between people who label themselves uh, King James only or um, Texas Receptus only or, you know, many times the ecclesiastical text guys will fall into that same camp. One of the things I've realised over the years is um, I believe that the King James is accurately translated. And so this usually sort of gets me sort of planted into um, a KJV only type of position. Now, that's what James White said to me the first time that I ever contacted him and talked to him. Um, many years ago, he basically said I was a Ruckmanite straight out. Um, in my first article on Easter, I actually said that I wasn't a Ruckmanite. And um, yeah, I I actually don't know that much about Ruckman. And what I do know is probably from James White. So I really think that I should probably go back through a lot of Ruckman's um, material on the King James. I have heard um, some of uh, Ruckman's followers and some people who have followed him and no longer follow him say that Ruckman never, ever claimed that the King James usurped the original Greek and Hebrew. Um, he said that it usurps the modern Greek and Hebrew. And so there's, you know, there's just the twist on words. And so we've got to be really careful um, that we don't just take what uh, Wallace and White and all these other guys are saying as gospel, because these guys just say these things as so matter-of-factly. Many times we don't even do a fact check. Now, I'm not saying we should go and follow Ruckman. I think he's a, um, he's heretical in, in lots of areas, but we don't want to be demonising people for the wrong thing. If Ruckman wasn't saying that about the King James, then we shouldn't be saying that he was claiming secondary inspiration, all this sort of stuff. And so um, I guess in a way I really should go through some of the Ruckman, Ripplinger and Sam Gipp material and really find out what's what they have said from their own mouth because um, no doubt people who now hold the TR position are going to be in the same boat as these people. <laughs> and that's what I... It, it's sort of coming to the conclusion where um, I'm looking at what's happening with a lot of you know ecclesiastical text guys, TR guys, and they are just being... Um, just railed on like the the King James the only crowd you know and so um you know we've got our own modern day characters like Stephen Anderson you know it's like yo you're an Andersonite are you you know instead of the Ruckmanite now it's Anderson and and um it's just the same play over and over again and so one of the things that's really helped me um I guess is I used to always just say look it's the B, the text of Beza, the 1598. That's the text that I follow. That's the Greek text. And, you know, I constantly, like yesterday, I spent a fair bit of time going through um, the 191 variations in Scribner's 1881 Greek text compared to that of the 1598 of Beza. And so um, it takes quite a long time to do this. I thought that I would do it in a few months, but it's taken years and years and years of just, you know, chipping away at it, and especially when you've got other projects going. But every now and then I'll just grab a scripture and I'll go through it and um, I'll find out exactly why Beza listed it in his... Well, he actually lists 190. For some reason, 191 was the number when I first started this article. Um, I don't know why. It was probably in a book I read or something like that. But um, I'll just quickly read through uh, one of the ones that I went through yesterday. So it was in Ephesians chapter 5, verse... 31. And so uh, in the 1611, it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and they, uh, sorry, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. It's interesting, he uses one word, shall be, because I've been going through that with the shalt be sort of thing. So in the text of Beza, it has patera for the word father. 
but Scrivener felt that it needed to be Ton Patera, which translates here as his father. Um, but it's interesting, in Beezus, um it has Ton Matera for his mother. So it's actually basically says, um, for a man shall leave, so this would be uh, a, um, sort of like an interlinear. A man shall leave um, father and his mother. That's how it sh you know should technically read. But the you know the King James translators, they're translating into English. They're they're not just um, you know doing a, a literal translation. Um, you know, like a Young's or something like that, or um, an interlinear type of thing. They they have to make it palatable, and so. Um, they have for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And so Scrivener saw this as a big enough difference to mention it. Now, what you've got to realise is Scrivener was on the translation committee of Westcott and Hort. Uh, he helped them with the Greek text. And so um, many times when you're looking through these you know, 190 or so um, uh, areas that he brought up, many times it's because the Westcott and Hort text go in that direction as well. And so um, he's looking at those issues. So um, what do we say here? Basically, I said Scrivener adds ton to Beza's patera. Um, but in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5, for example, ton patera does not translate to the father, but simply father. Okay, so we have um, an example of, of the opposite where you have the ton, the, the, the article ton and patera, uh, but it translates uh, it, does, it translates as father, not the father, um, where it says, a man shall leave father and mother. So we see in English, um, uh, ton patera at times was translated both as the father and also as just father. Um so uh, Patera was also translated as both the father and also father. So what we see, actually, I did have a scripture reference there. I think it was in John. Um, but I have a link there that goes to um, Bible Hub. Because Bible Hub, you can look at the Greek word and it will show you everywhere it appears in English. I mean, a lot of Bible programs do that nowadays, but that one's online. And so... Um, at the end of the day, there's examples there for um, when Tom Patera is um, translated as the father and also father. But then we have cases where uh, the ton is taken out and it's just Patera and it's the same. It's translated as the father or father. That's because uh, many times uh, the definite article is added there because we're translating into English. And so uh, that's... Um, that's the discretion of the translators. And so I, I don't think it was necessary for Scrivener to um, make a distinction there. And so I'm going to look into it a little bit further, but um, I don't think that it, it um, was warranted. So that's the sort of thing that I've been going through, um, checking out. Uh, because, say, on Twitter, uh, James White is basically saying that uh, the text of a Scrivener is just a back translation of the King James. And so I, I said, look, in all honesty, I've only found about 20 meaningful uh, translatable differences between um, the 1598 of Beza and the, and the King James. And so uh, I know Scrivener's, you know, he's, done 191 changes, but a lot of those changes, I mean, say, um, you know, a lot of those changes are actually just how words are breathed out, you know, so say, you know, is it Ozion or Hosion? Um, well, yeah, it can translate to Hosias or Ozias. Um, well, I mean, in the King James, it's Ozias, but they would have put that in there like that, no matter which way the breathing mark went. It just, it, it's not it, it's not like an issue. When you look at uh, issues like uh, Nazareth or Nazareth, they both translate into English as Nazareth or Beazel Bub or Beazel Baal. 
Beelzebub um, is the Latinized way of saying Beelzebub, and that just became very popular in, in in the English language, and so we've stuck with that. Um, but that, that's one of the things that's mentioned by Scrivener. And now Scrivener wasn't saying, you know, um, you know, this is sort of like the be all end all of 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 issues. These were just things that he just noted. Okay, there's a change here. Okay, most of them are just how things are sounded. And then um, a lot of the other changes are actually headings. You know, sometimes it will say the gospel according to St. Matthew, where, um, you know, Beza might just have uh, the gospel um, the gospel of St. Matthew, or it mightn't say according to, the kata might, mightn't be there. Just tiny little things like that to do with the headings. And so a lot of, a lot of the 190 differences are actually to do with headings. A lot of it's to do with phonetics. And so when you go through these, a lot of it's just like, actually, I, I don't think that really warrants a change. And so, but many times, um, like say, there's another example of Matthew chapter 10, verse 10 in Rabdon. Actually, I'll, I'm just in the page here, so I'll just go down to it. So with Rabdon, you have... Um, Rabdon is singular and Rabdos is plural. And so um, with the um, with the text of the King James, basically Jesus is instructing the 70 and saying, um, you know, don't take any uh, money with you. Don't take you know, um, two bags. Don't do this and that. And he says, nor staves. That's in the King James, which basically... In the uh, 2016 uh, King James Version would be um, nor staffs. So it's just plural for staff, okay? Um, so Scribner has looked at this and he said, hang on, that should be plural in the Greek, but it's singular in the Greek because it's translated plural in, in English. So he's gone, well, I'm going to change that. So he has changed rabdon, which is in the 1598 of Biza, to rabdos, the plural. But what he's... Like, he's good on looking at definitions, but he's failing in looking at the context. Because in the context, he's speaking to 70 people. And so, um, uh, if you were to say um, you know, to a crowd of people, okay, you have to leave your phone here. If you're talking to 70 people, you're obviously not talking about one phone. You know, they don't just all corporately own one phone and they put it there. No, they all own a phone. They... And so um, singular words can become plural in context. And this is one of the things which um, Scrivener overlooked. And so when people like James White are just saying, oh, okay, you know, the, the um, text of Scrivener, that one is, um, you know, just a back translation of an English Bible and all this. It's like, no, <laughs> you've actually uh, got someone just being a little bit over literal with how the King James was, was done there's a few errors here and there uh, in Scribner's but basically that's because if someone actually printed the 1598 of Beza people would probably carry that around but they don't and so but the thing is nowadays most people get stuff online it's not like you know oh, I carry my thing around and so that's you know it ha you know, it's bonafide because it's in paper things are bonafide now just on the internet and so you can look up the 1598 of Beza. I've gone through, I've um, attempted to put Beza into computer format. I've only done seven chapters, finished doing that a long time ago because it was so so time consuming. Um, but I, well, I guess I haven't finished. None of my pro projects are ever finished. They're just, they're just dormant. Um, yeah, so other examples. Like, so when, when I go through the first um, of the examples of the 198 examples that's like got um jeremiah um it's just a breathing mark jeremiah or jeremiah um if you look at even one that people would think is uh important 1598 of Beza says euron in Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse 11, where Scrivener uh, changed that for Edon and said he got that from the Complutensian Polyglot. But when you look at the Latin, uh, they're translated as invenerant in, um, uh, in the text of uh, 
Beza and also I think it's in the text of Erasmus or he actually has reparant. But when you go through these words, they're actually synonyms. Um, you know, if you saw something, you found something. So just say I was looking for hidden treasure and then I saw it um, right in front of me. I found it, you know, um, and this is the, this is one of the things where I don't think Scrivener was. Um, I, what I think is these type of arguments were getting thrown around at the time of Scrivener by um, people who didn't like the text receptus or the King James, and they're saying, "Oh, look at this! Yeah, this is a problem, and this is where it departs." And 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 so, in a sense, for for myself personally, I believe that the. The guys, the scholars of the Reformation period were brilliant. Uh, and so when you're looking at uh, guys like Beza, Tremelius, um, Janius, uh, Stephanus, Erasmus, when you look at the uh, King James translators, I mean, you know, they get mocked. But anyone who mocks these guys and says they're, they're not up to speed is just, it's almost like um, guaranteed that that person is just an ignorant idiot. I mean, someone... To say that you know they weren't capable in the Greek and yeah you know, they just have no idea what they're talking about. If you want to know more about the translators, go to my website tr.org.au. On the front page, you can uh, click on a link. It's just to the tran about the translators, and you can read through um, just a short bio of each one of them, and you realise you know, these guys were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you know, Lancelot Andrews, twenty one languages. I mean. You know, and James White, who speaks like Google Translate, um, you know, he, you know, it's it's just so pathetic for him to to just throw mud at these guys. You know, he he these guys would just absolutely laugh at him, and so um, it's it's quite disappointing to hear guys like Dan Wallace. And I think it look these guys are going to say this stuff uh, until Jesus comes back. It's it's. You know, there's once these guys are out of the picture, there'll be other people who come along and twice as charismatic, and you know they'll be you know have sound doctrine in every other part, but they just want to you know nail you on this thing. It's almost like they have all that tidy so they can get to this point. But um, it, what's more disappointing is just the people who are being persuaded by them, and so oftentimes I'll be on the net, I'll type in something that's just you. Know, pretty basic and that you'll just get hordes of people coming on and saying you know you're wrong and all that and it doesn't seem to matter how much information you supply or how far you go with trying to um, show people the truth um, people want to believe a lie people want to be deceived and that's one of the things Luther once said he said people actually want to be deceived it's part of their fallen nature they they want to be duped and um they want to listen to misinformation. The truth, the, you know, the stark truth hurts because there's the cognitive dissonance. You know, we, we've got our preconceived ideas of how the world is and what's happening. And when someone just comes along and cuts through all that, there's this dissonance. And we see that even if even if it's just politics, you know, someone writes something that's just true and, it, you know, half the world's upset and you think, you know, these people just aren't interested in truth. They're not interested in changing. They're not in interested at all in the facts. And so it's, I guess it's even more disappointing to see people parrot um, Metzger and, and Bart Ehrman. I mean, Bart Ehrman, I've been listening to his stuff for, you know, good, I guess probably 10 years now. And, um, I mean, the stuff that he said, is so, it's so easily debunked, but he is... Uh, you know, the leading text critic of the world and he's become an atheist and an agnostic and uh, his stuff is just like James White. It's 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 pathetic. And so, um, yeah, it, I guess in a way it's more just a shame to see more people get sucked in by this rubbish, you know. And I guess it's like when I listen to, um, say, Richard Dawkins speak, you know, apart from the charisma and, you know, the crowd clapping and cheering or, you know, whatever they do or the camera angles and things like that. Apart from that, if you actually just look at what they're saying, it's uh, it's irrational, it's illogical, it doesn't make any sense. And, um, and it's been debunked by thousands of people. And so 
Um, I've actually got someone at the door. It might be a Joe Hove. Blessings in this house. She lived here for. She came here in 19. 54. 55. 55. She only left two years ago. Oh, okay, yeah. See, because we were talking to uh, the neighbour out the back. He's yeah, really young, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. To Peach. Right. 31. saying, oh, it'd be great to actually go up and visit her, you know, like, and just because we're in the house and, you know, she's here by herself in the day, it's just, so I guess she's just thinking about that, and then, um, you know, she heard the other day, and then she was like, oh, you know, we didn't get the chance, opportunity to go up and just say hello when we're in the she house, and sort of half losing it, yeah. Right, okay, yeah. How far, how close the flood came? Uh, I think it was about this, but we weren't, we didn't stay, because we, okay. like, you know, I haven't really been... Hmm. Uh, in the area, like, yep. well, I've been in Lismore, but yep, not yep. in South. But I think it came up from that second step. Okay. It was about this, this far from the top underneath. Yep. And so, um, yeah, that was pretty, pretty full on. So. Yeah, we were.
Again, very yeah, much. Good to meet you. Yeah, yeah, no worries. And, uh, yeah, just went to church. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no worries, mate. Well, I'll, uh, well, I'll get your address. Yep. And so I'm often hanging out with Alan. I'm just kind of paying it. Yep. So, um, yeah, I can just, if there's any concerns, I'll just pop it straight in. Thank you very much. Well, that, the traffic probably won't be in the country. Yeah, I think the only thing we did have was a couple of like. <laughs> hey guys sorry about that um we just the lady who used to live in this house she just passed away so the son just came here and and was just asking if there was any mail and he yeah he grew up in this house he wanted to have a look and so i couldn't really just um stop it and i, I didn't want to lose the the mojo here so anyway what i'll do now that I've lost total train of thought, I'm really going to be going through the King James Only controversy of James White. Now, um, we're going to read what he has to say about Easter. Now, I consider myself a little bit of an expert on Easter, uh, seeing that I've written three articles on Easter. I've done two videos on it. And um, Answers in Genesis, they um, ran with one of my articles. They didn't print my article, but they referenced it uh, quite frequently. Um, I actually sent my first article off to David Crystal. Now, if anyone watching knows who David Crystal is, David Crystal um, is basically the world leading expert in the English language. I mean, just Google him. Just, yeah, he's probably written over 150 books. Like, he's, he's a legend. And uh, he's you know written books about the influence of the Bible, and he's actually quite an interesting guy to to look into. And now he's you know he's Roman Catholic, he's secular, but you know, he read my article and said, yeah, that's really good, good information, because um, you know he is a genuine bona fide scholar, where James White is a wannabe scholar. So let's look at what James White says about um, Acts chapter twelve, verse four, Easter. And, you know, it's in the chapter of problems in the KJV, okay? Um, but just before I go into that, I just want to clarify what I was getting at before. The TR position and the KJV position are many times seen as just, you know, poles apart. They're not that, they're not that different from each other. If you were living in the, um, the time of 1611... You would probably, um, if you if you're a expert linguist, expert translator, you would translate the text, the Greek text, pretty much exactly the same as the King James has it. Um, it's just a, a faithful translation. That's all the King James is. It's a very faithful translation. It's not the fact that it's the King James. It's not the fact that it's English. It just so happens to be in English, and it just so happens to be. Um, yeah, you know, a language that we still speak today. Now, if they had had 
um, you know, 60 of the best uh, translators and linguists and scholars of the land do it all into German. Um, I would respect that one, you know, but, but they didn't. They did it in English. And a lot of people, they think, well, you know, it's, it's an English Bible. And so um, you know, how can that carry the words of God sort of thing? Well, God saw it fit to um, to use the common everyday Greek language, which was thoroughly paganized. That many of the words used, uh, words like, you know, um, theos, we used to describe God, Greek gods, Hades, and these type of concepts, all um, to do with Greek mythology and things like that. And so God saw it fit to grab that language and use um, that language for his word. And so there's absolutely nothing wrong with having the word of God in English. And so I think it's actually been providentially done on purpose, where had the King James translators just printed a Greek edition with these 20 differences from Beza, I mean, 20 differences is, is almost not even worth mentioning, but there's 20 differences. Um, had they just printed a parallel Greek, there'd be no difference between King James and TR and all this sort of stuff. But um, these are the type of things where the tiny little minute details, these um, guys like White and Wallace and, uh, you know, Metzger and Ayland and, and um, you know, all the haters of the TR and, and the KJV, they're just trying to create a wedge between people. And I don't think there's that much different. Um, and so many times I find myself just defending the readings of the English King James. So that's what I'm doing here. So one might well, this is James White, one might well include the KJV's unusual rendering of Acts chapter 12, verse 4, as more of a mistranslation than an ambiguous reading. So he's saying it's a mistranslation. They, they just blundered, okay? Um, and it would be hard to argue given the facts. Now, now, when I read this, inside of me, I'm just giggling like a little kid because it's just like even just what he said there is just the most ignorant thing that I've read in since I last picked up this book. Um, just I, I'm actually going to stop and go through every line that he says and just explain why I think it's so dumb. Um, so basically, he's saying 60 of the most brilliant scholars ever at the time, at the peak time of the Reformation era, um, uh, with the culmination of all the English translated translations that went before it, um, with you know, the brilliance of people like John Boyce, if you don't know who John Boyce is, uh, read the Hebrew Bible at the age of five. Um, Lancelot Andrews, 21 languages. You look at Henry Seville, translated the complete works of Chrysostom from Greek into English in eight massive volumes. It was the biggest work ever completed um, at that time um, of pure scholarship completed. And so you know, that's just like three of, of the translators. I mean, I could just do a whole program on, on just the academic... Um, uh, brilliance of these scholars. And I'm not saying that because, hey, they're on our side and we're just blowing the trumpet. Like, I read um, Peter, Peter Gurry's um, article on Westcott and Hort the other day, went through it, and basically it was sort of like the relationship of Westcott and Hort and, you know, how scholarly they were and, you know, uh, how it took 28 years to do their text. And I'm like, yeah, that's all cool. But at the end of the day, it's still Westcott Hort, you know? You know what I mean? And so it's like, okay, you sort of roll your eyes a bit. And, and, and in a way, because these guys uh, were attacking the Bible, attacking the King James, and basically you trying to usurp its authority and the Texas Receptus, uh, you sort of see these guys as, you know, um, almost like Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said that to Peter. I said, look, you've come in, into a Texas Receptus Facebook group and you've po posted your article um, but you don't deal with things like how Westcott and Hort hung around a Unitarian and invited him to be on their committee. Unitarians would be like Jehovah's Witness. And how he was influential on the, the decision-making of, of the committee. 
um, you know, it doesn't talk about how um, they created, you know, some of the biggest blunders that appear in the critical text on myths and theories like, you know, Paul sung a hymn in the middle of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. They say, no, great is the mystery of godliness. godliness. He appeared in a body, which when it's os instead of theos, it's basically a predicate without a subject, which is the biggest grammatical error in the whole uh, critical text. And so it just makes, it's just ridiculous. It's, you know, the reading just becomes very stupid. And so, um, you know, Peter Gary is not mentioning those things or the whole concept of a Lucianic recension, you know, that um, a whole family of, of um, you know, texts just went missing sort of thing. And see, these are things that, that they don't want to remember. They just want to praise these guys as if they're legends. Now, there's enough said about King James and about the translators that's bad because, you know, obviously the BBC and, you know, they, they have an infatuation with the royal family and, you know, obviously it's the King James Bible. So, you know, they make out King James is a homosexual, uh, but they don't mention that he had eight kids and he was the only king in the whole of Europe at the time that slept in the same bed as his wife, that he actually wrote books against homosexuality and a whole bunch of other things like witchcraft and, you know, other things, but he was he was never accused of being a homosexual in his whole life, and so he had lots of enemies. And even his enemies would say, "Well, we can't fault his character." You're talking about in a day when you know you got Puritans and you got all this sort of stuff, but that because it's been put in our mind of these saucy royals and they're just having these sex scandals and all this, you know, it's just it's just ridiculous. But um, you know, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. And so, you know, when you've got someone like James White, who is, you know, saying, you know, he's the go-to guy for the, the King James. Um, you know, he says, one might well include the King James Version's unusual rendering of Acts chapter 12, verse 4, as more of a mistranslation. So it's just they mistranslate it. So instead of translating the word Passover, um, they... Um, they put in Easter by mistake, by mistranslation. Like, uh, hey, uh, hey, Lance, a lot. You know, do you think we should? Yeah, you know, he's making out that these guys are absolute fools. It's a bit like saying, um, you know, that you know certain astronauts couldn't do their times tables or something. It's just, it's so stupid to say this. But see, like I said in another video, many times you accuse people of what you yourself would probably do. And so, you know, if you're, um, you know, just say someone accuses you of stealing, you know, it's just out of the blue, like, you stole my wallet. It's like, no, I didn't steal your wallet, dude. You just stole my wallet. And then they find it on a bench. It's usually because they actually think that you're capable of doing that. That's because they they themselves are capable of doing that. You, you wouldn't steal anyone's wallet. So you're like, ah. Oh. So you were, if you lost your wallet, first thing you think is, I've lost it, I've left it somewhere. Other people like, someone else has stolen it. It's because of a mindset, and that's because throughout their life, they uh, have developed certain character traits. So when you've got someone like James White accusing people, um, you know, these brilliant King James Version translators, of just slipping on a banana peel, you know, it's so ridiculous. It just... And this is just the first sentence. Um, more th uh, so it's more of a mistranslation than an ambiguous. So it's either ambiguous or it's a mistranslation, but it's probably most likely a mistranslation, knowing how dumb and how uh, mentally retarded these um, King James translators were. It's like, pff, what, what a fool to say this. So, and he's like, and it would be hard to argue given the facts. And then he's like, note the text. And so then he's got uh, the King James Version on one side, the NASB on the other. Now, he was a critical consultant for the NASB, only the update. <clears throat> but um, I'll read both of them. So the King James Version has, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. 
Um, NASB says, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. Okay, so then James continues. The, the word the KJV translates as Easter appears 29 times in the New Testament. In the other 28 instances, the KJV translates this as the Passover. For example, in John chapter 19, verse 14, and it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, behold your king. King, Excuse me. Um, Need some more chai. So James writes, there is no reason for confusion about what Luke is referring to here. For the immediately preceding verse says, then were the days of unleavened bread. The days of unleavened bread were connected with the Passover celebration. Yet in this one place, the AV contains an anachronistic term, Easter. Luke's reference to the days of unleavened bread makes it clear that he is referring to the Jewish holiday season, not a pagan festival that did not become known by the term Easter for some time. Okay, so James White thinks that Easter is a pagan festival. Now, just remember that. I'm going to go back through some of this. What I'll do is I'll read what he said, and then I'll, I'll explain just how absolutely stupid and dumb this is um and if you think i'm going a little bit overboard with the um explanations about um what james white's saying um you know some people have been online recently saying oh we should befriend james white we should be nice to him we should you know you haven't read matthew chapter 23 where jesus got to into the pharisees faces and the Sadducees and said you bunch of snakes you hypocrites you liars you fools yeah, you know, um, isn't that part of being Christ-like? Was to be like Christ. A Christian is Christ-like. If you want to behave, what would Jesus do? He would rebuke this Pharisee, this Anglo Sanhedrin guy, James White. So that's what I'm doing here. Some KJV advocates have attempted to defend the anachronistic Easter at Acts chapter twelve, verse four. Um, using this as evidence of God's providential guidance of the KJV translators. And he's got a number here. See, Sam Gipp. You know, it's like, you know, the lowest hanging fruit. I, I know of about 30 articles that deal with this. Even Answers in Genesis actually deal with this. They're not King James only, but they know why Easter is in the King James Bible because they read my material. The argument is... <clears throat> that the Days of Unleavened Bread extended from the 15th to the 21st of the month, while Passover itself was on the 14th. Hence, according to this line of reasoning, the Passover was already passed, and Herod, a pagan, was referring to Easter in its pagan celebration, not the Passover. The problem, of course, is that the term Easter would still be a misleading translation. Since the celebration... um, Since the celebration the English reader thinks of is far removed from pagan worship of Astarte. Um, Number two, Herod Agrippa, according to the Jewish historian Josephus, was was a conspicuous observer of the Jewish customs and rituals. And since he was attempting to please the Jews, Acts chapter 12, verse 3, it is obvious that Luke is referring to the Jewish Passover, not a pagan celebration. Number three, the argument depends upon making the days of unleavened bread a completely separate period of time from the Passover. For the KJV only position, unfortunately, the Passover is used of the entire celebration. Um, including the days of unleavened bread after the actual Passover sacrifice uh, at other places in Scripture. Um, Note the wrapping up of the entire celebration 
within the feast of the Jews in John chapter 2, verse 13, 2, 23, 6, 4, and 11, 55. This attempt at saving the KJV from a simple mistake fails under examination. Okay, so what has James White done wrong here? Now, in the English language, we have used the word Easter uh, for quite a long time. If you go back to the Anglo-Saxon um, uh, Gospels, you will find that they use the word Easter quite frequently. And so um, many examples of this um, where you'll have you know, Easter tide and um, Easter... Um, I'm just, there's actually like about 20 words. I'm just trying to remember a few of them. Here we go. Easterly, Easter tide, East, Easter effin, which means Easter Eve or the day before Easter. Um, Easter ferum, which means the feast of Easter. Easter dig, which means uh, the Easter day or Easter Sunday. So they, all throughout Anglo-Saxon, the word Easter is, uh, is used, okay? Now, there was one, only one historian called Bede, the Venerable Bede. Now, he wrote a history about um, Christianity in England. Now, when he was going through the days of the month, uh, sorry, the, the, the pronunciation of the months in Anglo-Saxon, there was, um, when he got to April, it was called Yosta. Okay, totally, totally different pronunciation and everything. Yoster. So that was in April. And so uh, Yoster, he speculated that it could be related to a goddess called Yoster. And that's because some of the other months were named after gods and goddesses. So he was just like, well, I think it's named after this. That's the only mention of it in the ancient world. And basically, you don't hear anything um, before him. He mentions that in you know about the year you know seven fifty I think it was, and then all the way through up until about the time of Grimm, so you're looking like about yeah eighteen ten, and then um, Alexander Hislop in eighteen fifty three put it in his two Babylon books as just a fact that um, Easter and Yoster are the same, you know. So you have this one historian. And Charlemagne, he actually uh, made note of um, Bede, and he said that Bede was prone to exaggeration and that people were a lot more careful about um, you know, the pronunciation of names and things like that, and he said that Bede had made quite a lot of mistakes. And so um, it looks like almost everyone, for basically a thousand years after him, agreed because... Um, basically from Bede all the way through up until, you know, about 1810, you've got no one ever calling um, Easter, uh, like, or, or basically you've got a few people relating back to Bede, but you don't have people, um, you know, saying that they've found anything relating to this goddess or anything. So this translates into German as Oster, Okay. So, um, basically, Easter and Uster are related words. If you go through um, the word Easter, the word Easter used to mean the Passover and also the celebration of Easter, the New Testament celebration. So, obviously, people would recognize, oh, Easter means the New Testament celebration, but many people don't know it, it was actually the name of the... Um, the Jewish feast. And so um, many times it was the Jews themselves would use that word. It, it's Easter time. It's the, the, the Passover feast for them. And so um, it was only in, I think it was 1526, when Tyndale, he had um, completed his New Testament and he began to go through the Old Testament. And he was doing a version of that. And when he got up to Exodus, he had used Easter in his New Testament every time Pascha appears. So James White correctly says this, the word Pascha appears 29 times. Um, but he fails to say that Tyndale 
in his first New Testament, the first printed um, New Testament based on the, on the Greek, um, that he actually used uh, Easter for every single time, including references to the Passover and everything. And so when he got started doing the Old Testament, he got up to um, uh, Exodus chapter 12, where it talks about the Passover, you know, get a lamb and you know, put the blood on the door and all this stuff. And, you know, we, we know the story if you've ever watched the cartoons, you know, the Prince of Egypt and stuff, you know that. Or... <clears throat> and so basically it's a type of Jesus, you know. So you have the Passover lamb that became Jesus on the day, the 14th of this, and that's the exact day Jesus dies. That was the day that they were historically, every year they killed the lambs on that day. And so that was the exact same day Jesus died as well. And so they put the blood on the top of the door and on the sides that formed a perfect cross. You know, Jesus says, I'm the door and all this sort of stuff. And so there's lots, lots of pictures there. And all through the Old Testament, it speaks of Jesus. It speaks of this Messiah. And so, but when Tyndale's, you know, riding away and he's like, okay, well, get your Easter lamb. He's like, that doesn't really fit because he knew the correct etymology of Easter. Because... When you look at Martin Luther's Bible, he has Uster instead of Easter, okay? Uster. Where does Uster come from? Uster is from Ufersterhung, which means resurrection. So the word Easter is not Yoster, a pagan goddess of, of, um, of the spring, which one historian mentioned. It's actually related to the to the... Uh, Teutonic, it's related to the Germanic, and it means resurrection. So whenever you read resurrect, uh, whenever you read Easter, it just means to resurrect. That's what it actually means, uh, and that's how it was understood all the way through the Reformation. If you read their literature, that's that's how English people understood it. Uh, that's how translators understood it. And so, but what Tyndale realised was when he got to. Um, uh, sorry, um, Exodus chapter twelve. He was going through his um, going through his choice of words, and he realised you know, Easter doesn't really cut the mustard there because we're talking about an Old Testament celebration where Easter is more to do with the resurrection and the New Testament stuff. So he actually invented a word. He invented the word Passover. So before then, in England, they didn't have two separate words, but now they did. Now, in the Latin, they might have used Pasch or Pasca. Um, so in the, um, in the Greek, it's, it's Pasca, okay? So most other languages just have a word that's just transliterated from that. It might be Pasche or you might even know people with the name Pasch and things, in, especially in Italian or Greek communities. And that's because um, yeah, they're named after that celebration in their culture. But so the Passover, it still kept that Pasch type of sound, but it was, you know, the, when the angel of death passed over uh, the, the Jewish people, the angel of death, um, you know, killed the firstborn, but it went over the Jewish people. So that's the Passover. So he made two distinct words. So up until then, you basically had one word, Easter, which encompassed everything. And now you've got two words. And so... Tyndale basically did the five books of Moses. I think he did Jonah. And then the Roman Catholic Church um, uh, basically grabbed him, called him a heretic, and they strangled him and burnt him at the stake. So he, he's a very interesting guy. If you don't know about William Tyndale, type it into YouTube, type it into Wikipedia, have a look through his life. Brilliant guy, brilliant linguist. And so you sort of got this unfinished project. And so a guy called Coverdale, he took that up. And so, uh, and uh, just so happened at the same time that the King of England, who had basically been a Catholic up until that stage, he wanted to divorce his wife. And so he said, well, well, let's just become Protestants like the Lutheran, Lutherans. And so they became Protestants. And so he's like, well, we need a Bible. So he just grabbed um, the the Bible. It was basically by Tyndale and also you know, Coverdale had worked on it as well. And then that became eventually the Great Bible. So we're talking about, you know, only a few years after Tyndale's actually killed. And then you got a, um, a whole succession of other Bibles. You know, you had the Matthews Bible, you had the Taverniers Bible, you've had, um, you know, the most popular 
in that period was the Geneva Bible. And so that was done when, um, again, the Roman Catholics sort of took over England and they started burning everyone at the stake. And, you know, they, they were a bit like the ISIS of the Middle Ages. You know, they'd, they'd you know, burn down houses and kill children and do all sorts of horrible things. So uh, a lot of people fled to Geneva. And while they're in Geneva, they're like, well, we've got all these translators here. Let's do something. And so they did the Geneva Bible. And um, Theodore Beza was actually... His text was used, and he was one of the main guys there. Uh, when I say his text was used, uh, we're talking about his Latin and also his uh, notes on the, um, the text of Stephanus in the 1556. And so um, then you have um, you know, the Bishop's Bible, and all of these Bibles use the term Easter somewhere in it. Um, because during that time, from the time of Tyndale to, until the time of the King James translators, you now have these two words, and people didn't really know what to do with them. It's like, should we call Jesus the Passover Lamb or the Easter Lamb? That's in one Corinthians chapter five verse seven. You know, it says, "Christ, our Passover Lamb, is sacrificed for us." Where Tyndale had Christ, our Easter Lamb. So obviously, these guys didn't think it was pagan at all. They they had, that didn't even cross their mind. This is just. Um, a modern concept of misreading a guy who had a guess um, back in you know the year seven hundred and fifty, and so so during this time they're like okay so we've got um, we've got Easter we've got Passover, and so it was a little bit confusing as to you know where they're going to use the words. So what started happening? This trend started happening of only using Passover as an Old Testament word and only using Easter as a New Testament word. So when you're reading the early church writers, many times people, uh, especially during the Easter controversies, uh, the early church never debated about whether to celebrate Easter, but only just the day to do it on. So they were all, always saying, should we do it on the 14th of Nisan, or should we do it on the Sunday after the 14th of Nisan? And this became quite a, a big thing. And so they're writing rings of material. So we've got lots of material to show that they would use the Greek word Pascha, for both the Passover and for Easter. Because in English, we have two words for it, but the Greeks just use one word for it. And so, but it obviously changed after the resurrection. The Passover, Christians don't do the Passover anymore. We have our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. And so uh, we're not, um, you know, Hebrew roots or anything like that. And we don't have to you know, obey these laws and all, all this stuff. You don't have to obey these feasts and um, because uh, we have Jesus Christ in us. He fulfilled the laws. He did all those things. And so we have Christ in us. We don't have to do those things. And so that's what Paul called legalism in Galatians. You know, you, you observe months and days and years. I'm, I'm afraid for you, you know. But what Jesus did do is um, the night before he, um, you know, take this, to take this bread, it was unleavened bread without any um, leaven. So it was basically leaven is what ferment, ferments um, grape juice. It makes it alcoholic. So everything was unleavened. So that's people say, oh, Jesus drank alcoholic wine. Oh, it's just ridiculous, you know. But um, so Jesus is there passing this around and he said, do this in remembrance of me. So this is on the night just before Passover. So that's not the Passover. They're just about to do Passover, but Jesus never got there because he became the lamb of God that died on the cross. And so there's a whole study in that. But so basically um, from Tyndale, you've got, he's using Easter, then he invents the word Passover. Then you have Martin Luther, he has Uster, but then he also um, has a word Passa offer, which is you know obviously very close. So we're not sure whether um, you know, Tyndale borrowed it from Luther or Luther borrowed it from Tyndale, but they started using that. And then so we have all these Bibles right up to the King James. So you know what the King James guys did? They said, how about we clarify this whole issue? We'll only use Passover when it's the, the Old Testament feast, and we'll use the word Easter when it's the New Testament feast. Brilliant. Okay, so let's go through the Bible. You go through the 29 times Pascha appears. The only historical time that it appears as a New Testament word is in Acts chapter 12, verse 4, when obviously it's in the book of Acts in that context. Now, there's two other times after that in the New Testament, but both of them are talking about the Old Testament feast because it talks about 
um, you know, Moses kept the Passover. You wouldn't say Moses kept the Easter. You know, that, that's what creates a real anachronism. But um, you, the other one is Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. So obviously, it's the, he is the fulfillment of the shadow of the Passover lamb. So he is our Passover lamb, and he became our Easter lamb for us in English. You know? And so, but Acts chapter 12, verse 4 is the only time that um, Easter is used. And that was done by design because um, it's the only place historically in the book of Acts, it's after the resurrection. So it's a post-resurrection um, mention of Pascha. Luke was a born-again, spirit-filled Bible believer. And so he, when he was writing um, uh, his when he was writing his um his book when he got to uh Acts chapter 12 verse 4 he clearly understood that um by putting in the words them were the days of the unleavened bread that people would understand that it wasn't the passover feast of the day of the 14th of Nisan but it was after that so they'd already done the feast where they kill all the lambs but the passover went for 7 days so what the christians were practicing at that time um, was because you had the quarterdecimens, and so the quarterdecimens, what they were doing was um, they were practicing it on the fourteenth of Nisan, and so this is this even goes right back to the early church. Some people were like, "Well, that's the day Jesus died. We're gonna we're gonna um, celebrate on that day." So Jesus said, "You know, um, you know, have the have the grape juice, have the bread, have it on on that day that." You know, he said he'd do it because in the Hebrew calendar, um, the daytime or the date, uh, the next day started at uh, sunset. So basically, at roughly six o'clock at night, a new day would start where we basically go from 12 midnight. So, you know, it's, it, it, it takes a while to get your head around that. If you ever, ever worked for Seven Day Venice or anyone involved in that cult, um, you know, that type of mentality, you understand that because usually on Friday night at six o'clock, it's, you know, you can't work anymore sort of thing. And, and, but they can go back to work at uh, six o'clock on Saturday night. So it's just this whole concept of, you know, the, uh, the Hebrew calendar and how they had days. And so when you understand that Jesus, when he was sitting around with his disciples, it was on the 14th of Nisan at, um, after six o'clock. So the, the time table had gone over to, 14th he was with his disciples said look do this in remembrance of me and then it was still the 14th and this and all the way through till the next day at six o'clock and by then jesus had died probably about you know three o'clock in the afternoon or something like that and so that's why the quarter decimans they keep the 14th and they say that's the day that jesus died that's the day that we want to celebrate easter on okay and so um and what's interesting is that was basically the only biblical command to have the Lord's Supper. Now, I know a lot of people get upset with me about this because obviously the Roman Catholic Church have made it so if you don't do the Mass, you know, you obviously, you're going to burn in hell, that sort of thing. If you don't go to church on Sunday, you're, you're gone and all this. But um, many of the, the Reformed churches, unfortunately, are not that much more Reformed. They, they still have the tradition. They don't, just don't have the punishment. And so, um, but when you understand that, that probably took place once a year in the early church. It wasn't like just every Sunday thing. And I know, you know some people are just shocked by that. They're like, how can you say that? You know, we have our Lord's Supper and it's the Lord's table and they have all, you know, they've written books and stuff about it. But when you just go through the Bible and you understand that Passover was a yearly feast and uh, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And then it happens once, um, you know, every uh, every year, you know, at basically the same time, you know, because Passover carried over to Easter, and even though all the same words in, in basically Latin and Greek, Pascha, and so it was the same celebration. It wasn't like they were just celebrating the Pascha every Sunday. Um, but this became a Roman Catholic thing, and it's just spread into a lot of Christianity. And so, you know, I believe truly that, um, you know, yeah, celebrate Easter, that's fine. Think of Jesus, think of how he died and, and was buried and rose again and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, yeah, but, yeah, to to do it every 
Sunday. Look, I'm not saying you can't do it every Sunday. You can do whatever you want every Sunday, you know. But I'm saying saying to be strictly biblical. And so I know some churches, they do it once a month. You know, they have, um, you know, the Lord's Supper. Some just do it on special occasions. So, oh, it's sort of Christmas. Let's just do it, you know. Or it's, we just decided to do it today, you know. It's like, okay. Um, but if you want to be strictly biblical, it's on the, the day. Basically, Easter usurped the Passover. The Passover is the old shadow and type easter is the fulfillment it's the resurrection it's to do with all that and so um and also the days um a lot of people get mixed up with the days um you know you have the um the guys like uh chuck missler you know he says that jesus died on a wednesday uh but when you count the days that makes him dying uh sorry resurrecting on a saturday (laughs) it's like man it doesn't work out because he rose on the third day, you know, clearly says that. So, but then you have, you know, the typical thing of, you know, and James White talks about this as well, and that's another thing I'll have to debunk him on, but this is just a bit of a rabbit trail. And so another thing is, you know, James White um, and, you know, Roman Catholics and other people, they say he died on the Friday. And, you know, it's just sort of... Um, it's not literal, literally three days and three nights. It's just an idiom sort of thing. An idiom is just like training cats and dogs or, you know. But if you just read the Bible, literally, if you just count the days, you go, okay, he rose on the Sunday morning. If you just count it back, you get Thursday. You get Thursday roughly about three o'clock in the afternoon that Jesus died. Um, see, Thursday is perfect. You get um, you know, Thursday, he obviously died just before um, the Sabbath. See, a lot of, that's where people get mixed up because they think it's the weekly Sabbath, which it's not. After the 14th of Nisan, the very next day was always a high Sabbath. It's a bit like we have Christmas and the next day is Boxing Day. It's just going to follow it, you know, no matter what day it is, you know. And so it was the same in the Hebrew culture. They had the 14th of Nisan, kill the Passover lambs and everything. The next day is going to be a public holiday. Don't do anything. Don't. So it was quite a big deal because... So what happened in this year, you actually had on the Thursday was the 14th edition. The Friday was the main, you know, day off, you know, because of the Passover. But then the next day after that was a Saturday, which was the weekly Sabbath. So you had these two Sabbaths in a row. So that's why people get confused because they're like, oh, you know, they were trying to bury Jesus before the Sabbath and all this stuff. They're thinking Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. But it's not. It's a totally different concept. So... When you have Jesus dying on Thursday, um, you wouldn't count that day. He's died just before um, the 6 o'clock time when the calendar's going to flip over to the 15th. So 14th, he dies. He's one night in the grave. Friday, he's in the grave, okay? Then Friday night, he's also in the grave. That's the second night. So the Friday's the first day. Saturday is the second day. Saturday night is the third night. Sunday is the third day. Um, I'm pretty good at mass. Uh, <laughs> when I add those things up, that they make it makes perfect sense to me. Um, and so um, Jesus died on Thursday. Um, he um, resurrected on the Sunday. Now, a lot of people say, oh, it has to be 72 hours and all this. Uh, no, it's just he rose on the Sunday. So it's three days and three nights. But then it's clarified by these other statements that Jesus will rise on the third day, not after the 72 hours, not after, you know. So what we see is on the third day, on the Sunday morning, uh, in the middle of the Hebrew day, basically, Jesus resurrected. So that to me, that makes a lot more sense in a Wednesday thing or a Friday thing. It's just, you know, and there's a lot of other guys who believe that as well. Um, so what we see in the King James translators, they translated the word Easter and they used it in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 uh, to show us that it is in a post-resurrection setting. So some guys were celebrating it on the 14th of Nisan and other, other people, and this is basically what we do today as well, they would uh, celebrate it on the Sunday after the 14th. So you have the 14th of Nisan, so just say that's a Tuesday, the next Sunday is Easter. That's how they figured it out. And so the Hebrews run their calendar by the moon. And so that's why we, you know, in our Gregorian calendar, we have it all over the place. 
Um, but basically, if you were to you know, run the calendar by the moon, you would have it you know, at a set time every year. But we don't have that. And so um, the, um, the Easter celebration uh, is on the Sunday after the 14th. And so this basically was became the most popular position. Um, this was also uh, what was... Uh, clarified in the Council of Nicaea. I'm pretty sure it was brought up in the Council of Nicaea. Yes, it was. And um, they they solidified the date of, of Easter. And, uh, you know, early church writers write about it. But the quarter decimans, they were sort of frowned upon as legalists because they were like, hey, well, the law says to do this. And it's like, well, we're not under the law. We're under grace. We want to do it on a Sunday and da-da-da. And so there was a bit of a kerfuffle be between Christians you know, early church writers or whatever you want to call them. And so what about the whole concept of there being a pagan goddess? Now, there was a guy called Alexander Hislop. Now, he wrote a book called The Two Babylons. This is in um, 1853. Now, he basically said that Easter is the pagan goddess Ishtar. It's a Phoenician goddess, just because they sound the same. Now, that would be like me getting uh, on camera here and saying George Bush is the same as the burning bush because they sound the same, you know, or, um, you know, to stalk someone uh, is just giving them flowers because it's a flower stalk. It's, you, you can't stalk someone on the phone, you know, like just assuming that they're the same meaning, you know. It's, they're absolutely completely different meanings. The word Easter comes from the Teutonic language, which is where Germanic comes from. We have a whole bunch of words um, related to that, like say, if you look at um, Austria, Austria. Now that's called the Österreich. Now Österreich is basically the Eastern Kingdom. It has the word Uster in it, which is the same word um, Luther used because they say Luther's word Uster is pagan too. You know, it's Uster. This goddess called Uster, which in English is Easter. It's Ishtar. It's you know. So they've just made up this whole thing about this pagan goddess, just to, just basically out of thin air. Um, totally not mentioning that, um, you know, Ersterhung, uh, which means resurrection, it comes from Ust, meaning east, and first, Erst, Ersterhung. And so um, east is Ust. We look at Austria, the Osterreicher, the Eastern Reich, the Eastern Kingdom. Okay, so Austria. Now, we don't think Austria is evil just because it has Ust in it. You know, lots of words have Ust. Um, we don't think, like, the word East is evil. You know, I, I live in Eastern Australia. We have, Byron Bay is the most easterly point. It's not like every time East is mentioned, I'm like, oh, it's a goddess. It's a pagan thing. It's like East, East. East. But if you say it Easter, um, it's a pa pagan thing all, all of a sudden. And it goes back to Yoshta, which is, you know, some goddess. And so... Uh, it's quite amazing. So basically, Hislop claimed that um, Easter is Ishtar. Um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, that was pretty bizarre. And so um, there was a guy called Ralph Woodrow, and he actually was writing a lot of Hislop-style books, um, but he actually repented of it. And he pointed out that Hislop theorized that Nimrod, Adonis, Apollo, Ates, Balzabub, Bacchus, Cupid, Dagon, Hercules, Janius, um, Linus, Lucifer, Mars, Meridoc, and he's just got a whole list of names, which include Astarte, um, Aphrodite, you know, all these sex goddesses and everything. He said, you know, and in the list he's got Easter. He says they're all the same god. It's just like, like kindergarten level scholarship. It, and... Not once does Alexander Hislop in his two Babylons mention that Luther used Uster in his Bible, that um, Uster is short for Uferstahung, which means resurrection. He never mentions that. So when you look at, say, a scholar like um, Cruz, um, uh, let me just find Cruz's quote. I might just see, are you... Okay, C.F. Cruz in 18, 1850s, this is about three years before Hislop wrote his, um, his book. Uh, he said, 
Our word Easter is of Saxon origin and of precisely the same import with its German cognate Ustern. So Uster is the older way of saying it. Ustern is the modern way. Uh, the latter is derived from the old Teutonic or first a hen or first a hung, that is resurrection. So we're talking about a bona fide linguist and scholar. I think when he wrote that, oh, actually, it's footnote number 13. He was actually, yeah, he was uh, translating Eusebius's ecclesiastical history. So this is a bona fide translator, you know. <laughs> Um, Hislop was just a Scottish Presbyterian pastor who didn't even he wouldn't have even known German or anything like that. You know, he had no idea. So, um, so you had this conspiracy theory start, and who loves conspiracy theories? Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses they love that stuff. Seventh Day Adventists, but unfortunately, what we're seeing is a lot of Christians love this sort of stuff too, and they. I I actually like um, the conspiracy theories that are based upon fact, you know, um, not, you know, if they can be easily disproven, like what I'm doing now, I don't like to be part of that crew, you know, sometimes you believe something and someone just comes along and writes it off and you feel like a, an absolute dimwit. Now, one of the funny things is I used to believe Easter was pagan because that's what I was taught. And I was out preaching one night in Lismore and I was standing out the front of a pub and talking to people and I said to this one girl I said do you want to come out to an Easter service she said why would I come out to a service named after a pagan goddess and straight away I said no you're right it is named after a pagan goddess and then it just and I didn't even know where I'd got that answer from it was probably from reading vines or something or strongs or so anyway then I started looking into it and then I discovered all this material that I'm reading to you now. This is in about 2004. Uh, so in 2006, I wrote this article. And uh, since then, I've, I've done a video. If you go to easterau.com, um, you can see what I've done there. Easterau, that's one word, dot com. And, uh, and so what I did is... Um, that, you know, obviously we had Easter at that time, so I started to study Easter and you know, I wrote this and um, it totally changed my mind and it actually was the tipping point for me to realise that I was not well educated in, um, in linguistics, I was not well educated in, um, in textual criticism, I, I thought that the King James translators could just make it a blunder, like what James White says. So when I'm reading James White stuff, I'm laughing at it now, like, you know, but years before, uh, I would have been like, yeah, because I didn't know. I had no idea about this sort of stuff. And that's why I've educated myself. And that's why I've done these articles. I mean, oftentimes, it's the things that you're wrong on that you become an expert on. And so I was wrong on Easter. And so I, I wrote the first article and then all this other stuff. Um, came out, and, and I'll go through that in a minute. But, um, you know, when James White's like, oh, it's more of a mistranslation than, than an ambiguous reading, Yeah, he doesn't bring up anything about the etymology, the true etymology of Easter. He just says it's pagan. So he's actually following the conspiracy theory. It's a common conspiracy theory. It's what Wikipedia would put on their thing. I've tried to put some in interesting stuff on Wikipedia on that uh, Easter page, but the, they won't run with it. Um, and even, um, you know, like I said, world leading expert on the English language, David Crystal. Um, he said that my article, this article that I'm, I'm gleaning through now, he said that it was good and the information was accurate. And so <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, a guy from Arizona with a with a Bible degree, you know, saying it's it's a pagan thing or world leading expert on the English language. You know, who am I going to trust there? Um, and the thing is, I studied this for years. So going through it, um, and what I'll do is I'll, you know, I've sort of finished with what James White said there, but I'll just go through um, some of the information. So, okay, I'll go to the second article. If you want to watch, um, I've got an hour, an hour long video that explains the first and second articles. And then the third article um, is in a about a 45-minute video. And so the third article hasn't been written that well. It was a bit rushed. And so I encourage you to probably watch the video on the third article. 
Um, so Article 2, what I uh, speak about is, you know, so the New King James has come along and said, we're a New King James. Um, we are going to change the word Easter in Acts chapter 12, verse 4, back to Passover because, um, you know, of this pagan concept. And it's like, so they've followed that as well. So we see errors um, where people don't understand their own language. They're not understanding English. And like I said, Easter is from Saxon origin. It's precisely the same import with its German cognate, Ostern. The latter is derived from the old Teutonic form of Ufersterhen, Ufersterhung, that is resurrection. So that's what Cruz said. Um, but then you get people say, no, um, Easter... You know, some people say that um, Easter is not actually a pagan festival, but it's just an old way of saying Passover, which we don't... We don't use anymore or an old way of saying passover and easter so we don't use that anymore and it should be passover in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 so some people um go that route um but basically luke put in them were the days of unleavened bread for a reason now when we look at say the liberal um bible translator so he worked on the american um american standard version 1901, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, Philip Schaff, he said, so he's not a friend of the TR or KJV or anything, he said, Easter is the resurrection festival which follows the Passover proper but is included in the same festive week. So this is where a lot of people get it wrong. They think that um, they're thinking in today's terms. We have Passover and Easter. Sometimes it can be nearly a month apart. But um, what was happening back then before the Gregorian calendar, um, Easter and Passover over were always in the same week and so pretty much all over the world. So the Jews would celebrate their thing and the Christians would do their thing. And so, you know, the Jews would call it Pascha. We would call it Easter in England. Um, they would call it um, Pasha um, or Pascha in Greek. And so, um, but yeah, so even in Greek, they call the Passover Pascha. And so they call Easter Pascha as well. So that's one of the things. So Luke didn't have separate words in Greek uh, to specify the difference between Passover proper and the resurrection celebration Easter. So we used Pascha because, um, you know, we today have two separate words, you know, for the New Testament feast and for the Old Testament Jewish um, shadow. So, but Luke back then, he was just using Greek. And so he's like, okay, well, we'll use Pascha. But then he said, then were the days of unleavened bread. And so what that did is it pointed people in the direction that it's not the Passover feast, it's after then. So like I said before, the quarter de decimans, they were always sticklers for it's on the 14th. But he's saying it's after the 14th, it's in the days of unleavened bread. So um, that, that's why it's named Easter. So Easter is the following uh, Sunday, the celebration uh, of the Christians. And so that's one position. Now, um, can I defend that 100%? Well, I can't defend that 100%, but it, it, to me, it makes reasonable sense. My uh, understanding is that the way it's um, Easter is written is, is it covers that whole period of time, is an Easter celebration. So you, basically, on my side of the fence, you've got two different types. So you've got some people who say it's the Sunday after, so um, re representing the 17th of Nissan when Jesus rose again from the dead and, and all that stuff. But then you've got people who just sort of have a blanket term of Easter upon that whole period. And so I'm of that because I can't defend the other one because I don't really know the dates of that era, whether it was a Sunday or, you know, um, when, you know, so I just haven't figured that out yet. So I guess that's going right into the microscopic detail. I'm, I'm still looking at that. And just being totally honest with you. But um, the whole week would have been called Easter by the Christians. And so um, there's a guy called Gerhard Kittel. Now, Gerhard Kittel, no friend of the King James, no friend of um, you know the text receptors. He even went to jail um, for being a anti-Semite. He was in the Nuremberg trials. <laughs> he, was, he hated Jews. He was Hitler's theologian. But he said, you know, a blind dog can find a bone every now and then. So he said, Pascha came to be called Easter in the celebration of the resurrection within the primitive church. 
So he's basically saying Pascha became Easter in the primitive church. And so it was a celebration of the resurrection in the early days. Um, Alfred Erdeshim, who's actually a good guy, he's a Messianic Jew of the 19th century, he said of the Last Supper, it was to be the last of the old Paschas from the time of the cross um, was to be, sorry, it was the last of the old Paschas, the first or rather symbol of promise of the new. So the, when Jesus was basically um, you know, sitting around, you know, eating the bread and all that sort of stuff and having the grape juice, that was like the last of the old Paschas. Well, the next day he died on the cross, and that was the, the last of the celebration. Um, but then everyone after that was to be the new celebration. And so it just so happens in English, we give that a name. We call it Easter. We don't call it Passover anymore because we don't think the Christians celebrated Passover. We just have two words, and so we, we, we're utilising them. Um, and so, yeah, we've talked about the quarter decimans. Um, and we know that there was uh, a lot of chat, chit chat uh, in the early um, church about Easter. But then it comes to the King James translators, okay? So let me just read what James White said again. Under his problems in the KJV, one might well include the KJV's unusual rendering of Acts chapter 12, verse 4, as more of a mistranslation than an ambiguous rendering. It would be hard to argue, given the facts, you know. Um, let me just talk about Henry Seville. The King James translator Sir Henry Seville was briefly mentioned uh, in our last article, so I'm just reading my second article. Uh, he was an expert on the Greek language, mathematics, and church history, and had been personal tutor in Greek and mathematics to Queen Elizabeth. If you're going to be the Queen's tutor, you, you'd sort of have to know what you're doing. Do you think James White could be the Queen's tutor in Greek? <laughs> okay. He wouldn't even be able to have a full sentence in Greek, you know. Um, and so Henry Seville's like, you know, the best Greek tutor of, of the whole era, you know. Um, he also founded the first chairs of geometry and astronomy. astronomy. So he knows his stuff. He's, he's a scientist. Uh, his greatest work, besides his work on the King James Bible, was translating the complete works of the most famous Greek church father, John Chrysostom, from Greek into English. During his compilation of um, 15,800 manuscript sheets, he scoured all the great libraries of Europe, buying the oldest and purest of the Chrysostom manuscripts. Seville's edition of Chrysostom has been called the one great work of Renaissance scholarship carried out in England and was the most considerable work of pure learning undertaken in England at the time. So he's writing books that are bigger than anyone's ever written before, in England and translated from Greek. So this guy knows his stuff, you know. I mean, if you get a book and it's translated from any other language, you would expect that the person knows both of those languages rather well. Um, so Seville, who frequented Europe, was considered by some as the greatest scholar of the age. Adam Nicholson, he's a secular guy, now he wrote a book on the translators, but he dispelled the myth that the King James Bible emerged from an isolated and insular England by saying a river of European influences runs through it, that's the version, and through no more open conduit than Henry Seville. Um, so Seville, he was part of the translation committee that translated Acts chapter 12 verse 4. That's why I'm mentioning him. Uh, he was a member of the Oxford Translation Committee assigned to translate Acts, the Gospels and Revelation. Seville was often called in by King James personally to translate books into Latin, Italian, or French because he knew all these languages like this. Chrysostom, um, whose works uh, Seville translated from Greek into English, was staunchly opposed to the quarter decimans, the, the date of the 14th of Nisan to have Easter. So, this is so you've got a Greek guy called Chrysostom, basically around the year 400. And so he is, you know, the most famous um, theologian of that time, Greek theologian. And so he is writing about the quarter dec decimans. So he's writing in depth about these Easter controversies. Okay. So these uh, mainly occurred in Asia. 
While Irenaeus claimed it had roots in the apostolic tradition via John, uh, the majority of the church practiced Easter on the Sunday after the Passover feast. In his 1612 um, of homilies 27 volume 6, um, which is Discourse 1 in Patrologia uh, Graeca versus Eudeos, Seville gives the title, this is this is um, Chrysostom's title. So this is just the part of a chapter of a of a book that um, of um, Chrysostom that Seville's translated, and this is the title: um, Discourse against those who were Judaizing and observing their fasts. So he understood that you know people were trying to put the fourteenth of Nisan into Easter and they were pushing this and it was a legalistic type thing. So Chrysostom's there um, writing about this. He's writing chapters on this. Um, So interestingly, um, the earliest book with mathematical content to be printed at Oxford was Compotus uh, Manualis Ad Issum Oxoniumsum probably said all that wrong. That's all in Latin. Um, printed by Charles Kyforth in 1520, the book explained how to make calculations for the date of Easter. So he's an, an Oxford man um, you know, doing all the calculations of Easter. The second mathematical book to be published in Oxford was Sir Henry Seville's um, lectures on uh, Eusid's Elements, printed in 1621. So you've got the first book, it's all about the Easter dates. The second book is by... Henry Seville, who's obsessed with Easter, he's obsessed with Chrysostom, he's translating all of Chrysostom's material. Chrysostom's writings are all about the quarter decimans and the date of Easter and all this sort of stuff, okay? I'm just showing you, James White says, let let me just read it again, let me just, I might just read this a few times throughout this, you know, this is in the problems in the KJV, this is just one of the examples that he gives and we're going to go through these because a lot of people think there's problems in the KJV. I haven't found any. I think the problem is with um, the literacy of this generation of scholars like James White. One might well include the KJV's unusual rendering of Acts chapter 12, verse 4, as more of a mistranslation than an ambiguous rendering. And it would be hard to argue, given the facts. Okay, so... Let's look at what these guys did. Bancroft, uh, actually, no, I'll read this. If one were to search the biographies of Christian history to select a person equipped to translate um, Acts chapter 12, verse 4 from English into Greek, it would be hard to discover anyone more able than Seville. So just say I said to you, okay, here's a time machine. You can pick anyone you want and you're going to do an English translation I want you to pick the best translator to translate this one passage. Um, if you went through all the history books, you would probably get Henry Seville. He's obsessed with Chrysostom, uh, um, who was an Chrysostom was an enemy of um, Cortodesimanism. Um, Seville was intimately acquainted with all the Easter controversies. He's translated them from Greek into English, so you have to know your stuff. Um, He's a noted mathematician with a mind for detail and chronological events. Uh, He's one of the greatest English-Greek scholars who personally tutored the Queen of England, one of the most famous queens ever in England. Um, So I doubt you'd find anyone more appropriate than this guy. I I haven't. (laughs) And I wrote this in like 2004, I think it was, 2006 or something. And it's like, I I'd still, when I go through all this Easter stuff, I don't find anyone who knows the stuff that Seville knows about this. And so, um, let me just read James White again. <laughs> because I just want to hammer it home that what James White is saying is just so stupid. One might well include the KJV's unusual rendering of Acts chapter 12, verse 4, as more of a mistranslation. So he's saying this guy got it wrong. This guy tutored the queen. This guy, attention to detail, knew all about the, you know, as if he's just going to, it's going to get printed out. And he's like, oh, they, they're stupid. They, they did a mistranslation there. Or, you know, as if, 
you know, so that would be a printing error. But if, if it was a mistranslation, he would be personally just messing up. So what, what it's, I can't even describe it. It's just so dumb, this statement. That shows you how illiterate James White is about the, the King James scholars. Um, okay, so there's a guy called Bancroft. Now, he was one of the uh, scholars um, on the King James Version Committee. Uh, he penned the rules to be observed in translation. He lists some interesting um, procedures that demolish myths about private interpretation. So even though we've got Henry Seville here, brilliant guy, he worked on the Book of Acts. He actually personally translated Acts chapter 12, verse 4. Um, and they, you know, they went through the Gospels and Revelation as well, so pretty much covered most of the ground there. Um, we've got um, all these other translators uh, who went through this as well. Now, James White recently has been saying, oh, the King James translators didn't know what the other group were doing because you had, you know, different committees. You had, you know, 10 guys over here and 10 guys over there and they didn't have fax machines and they didn't have, you know, mobile phones and how could they know what they're doing and all this sort of stuff. Let me just read how they did it. So rule eight, this is Bancroft's rule, every particular man of each company to take you some chapter or chapters and having translated or amended them severally by himself, where he th thinks good, to all meet together, confer what you have done, and agree for the parts that shall stand. So just say uh, there's about 60 um, men involved in the King James Version translation. Um, so there's six groups. So just say there's 10 in each group. It just makes the maths a bit easier. So you've got 10 guys all, all sitting around translating. So what they had to do, they took the chapter with them, um, they worked on the chapter or chapters and they, they went through and translated it by themselves. Then they brought it back and they had to agree on which parts will stand. And so you imagine uh, you've got, um, actually I might even bring up some of these um, translators, uh, tr.org.au. <clears throat> Here we go. It's a little bit slow there. And so, um, whoops, yeah. Now, King James Version translators. Mm -mm -mm. Yes. Got the site right there. Perfect. So you've got guys like, um, yeah, even the guys who oversaw the final production, you got Lancelot Andrews part of that, spoke 21 languages. Even if he was to translate this Bible by himself, you would be like impressed. You've got 60 guys who are, um, you know, some of them are on par with that, some of them less, but um, brilliant guys. And so um, I'm looking at the website kingjamesbibletranslators.org. And so you can look at all the biographies of all these guys. And so, where are we? We're in the, I think it's the first Oxford company. No, it must be the second Oxford company. Yeah, so in this company, we have Thomas Rabbis, we have George Abbott, we have John Allenby, we have Richard Edis, we have John Hamar, Leonard Hutton, James Montague, John Perrin, Ralph Ravens, Henry Seville, and Gillies Thompson. So I actually write about these guys also in my Revelation 16.5 article. Um, but say, we'll just pick one at random. George Abbott. Yeah, yeah. James White's saying they mistranslated, okay. Um, George Abbott, a young man, he had a, actually I'll go through his career, he became a popular lecturer, um, Oxford, Faber and Brancroft, Yeah, so he was part of Acts. Um, mm, 
it doesn't really like yeah sorry about that I, I was sort of hoping that it would be a bit like da white's book da wait not da white da wait's book that um explains you know the the credentials of these guys i think i've got more of that information on my um on my uh website tr.org.au but i don't want to stop the flow so let's just keep reading okay so basically what they had to do all of those guys who I just mentioned, they all had to personally translate the Bible. They would all bring it back, and then they would agree with what would stand. And then, um, so thus the translators of Acts, for example, all personally translated the book by themselves, and then their particular group corporately amalgamated those personal translations into one copy, which was wholeheartedly agreed to by the entire group. So even just, that's usually what a, a normal translation committee would have, you know, just a group of guys like that, and they would all agree and say, yes, this is what we want to stand. And you've got to understand, too, that these guys, um, you know, many of them spoke multiple languages, and so they say in the translators to the reader that they went through the Dutch, they went through the German, they went through the Italian, they went through all the languages that they knew, uh, looking at style, looking at wording, looking at different things. And so um, so then they'd bring it together and they'd have to explain to each other, you know, these are top-notch scholars doing this. So rule number nine states, as one company hath dispatched, dispatched any one book in this manner, they shall send it to the rest to be considered of seriously and judiciously, for his majesty is very careful on this point. So basically, once the group had reached the consensus, they sent their manuscript of, of the Book of Acts, for example, to the other five groups. And they all were personally read it. So you had another, you gave it to 50 other guys to read and to go through. Okay. Rule 10 records if any company upon you review of you, I'm reading the old English review of you books so sent really doubt or differ upon any place to send them word thereof note the place and withal send their reasons um to which if they consent not the difference to be compounded at your general meeting um which is to be of the chief persons of each company um at the end of your work and so basically uh there was a chance to respond to the reviewers um, in front of a committee. And so these 50 guys, they could, they would, um, you know, note the places and they would go through reasons of why, you know, th there was these issues. So rule 11 says, when any place of special obscurity is doubted of, letters to be directed by authority to send to any learned man of the land for his judgment of such a place. So just say someone, you know, said, oh, I don't think Easter should be there or whatever. They, they could send that to anyone in the land. And just like, you know, I sent my first article to David Crystal. He said it was great. Uh, so th that just solidifies your argument. You think, well, you know, it's, um, yeah, someone who's of high degree thinks, thinks what I said was correct. And so um, that's what these guys would, would do as well. That wasn't just the translators. They were able to send it off to other learned men. And, and you might have had people who were experts in um, botany or something like that. And when they're going through the translation and they're like, you know, what, what about this tree? Is it a, a beech tree or is it a pine tree? Or what, you know, and then they go and they talk. They were talking to Jewish people. They are talking to many cultures. They, they were reading many documents to, to get their answers. And looking at, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of previous works in translations all throughout Europe. So basically, um, if agreement couldn't be reached, further authorities in the land were to be consulted on particular matters. This reveals the great lengths that went into the translation accuracy. And so... <clears throat> um, another thing is... James White's saying it's a pagan festival that's been mis just mistranslated. It's like, you know, all these guys are just sitting around. You know, 60 guys just sitting around and, you know, so they write, you know, okay, we're going to put Easter there. They send it off to these other 50 and they're all like, it reads all right to me. And they shut the book and they go and print it. And it's, oh, it's a mistranslation, you know. Years later, someone like James White, brilliant. Oh, James White discovers this. It actually, it was Hislop who's... Scottish guy who couldn't speak any other languages. But um, what you've got is the total ignorance of what's in the King James Bible. See, Easter just doesn't appear 
once in the King James Bible. It appears many times. Now, let me read this to you. Um, in the previous article, there is also confirmation for the fact that the King James Version translators defined Easter as the resurrection of the Lord. So we went through that. It means um, Uster in German or first the hung is, is, the, the, um, is where that word comes from. In their frequent mention um, in the various lists and tables of the preface of the KJV itself, it shows to us um, that to the translators, Easter was the holiest day of the year. So basically they had calendars in the front of the Bible. So if you get a, a original King James, if you look in the beginning, it's got you know um, to find Easter forever. It's one of the whole pages. And it goes through a whole bunch of lists of you know the dates to find Easter on and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so they weren't talking about the Passover. <laughs> they weren't talking about find Passover forever. You know, um, and then many times, you know, because, you know, th this, all this work was done under the, uh, under King James, who was, you know, the Anglican king in England's church. So they had celebration days where they'd have days off and all that sort of stuff. So, um, let me just read this in the preface which was in the front of the original 1611 Bible, Easter is referred to in an almanac for XXXIX years um, and a date provided for each one of those years. This indicates that Easter, in this case, refers to the Easter celebration by Christians for Christ's resurrection and not for the Jewish Passover. Also, the following page, which is a table to find Easter forever, refers to the Christian Easter. In addition, the table proper lessons to be read for the first lessons at morning and evening prayer refers to the Christian Easter and also includes other days such as Whit Sunday and Trinity Sunday, which are holy days determined by the date of Christian Easter. Um, it is also true in the table proper Psalms on certain days and the following page events for um, before and after Easter. Um, they're described there. So... When Easter was referred to in any of the 1611 um, preface or, or prefaces or tables, it was referring to what we know as Easter. It's not referring to anything else. So they get to define what Easter is <laughs> in that era, in that edition. It's like, okay, we're using this word Easter and we've also used it in the preface and, and a whole bunch of other things. And and um, they define that word that, and the... Uh, so it never refers to Easter as Passover. And when Passover is referred um, to, it is the Jewish holiday. So when it's referred to, it's the Jewish holiday. From the above, we must conclude that when Easter was inserted by the King James Version translators, it was done so by design, showing their trend of using Easter as a post-resurrection Pascha and Passover as a um, pre-resurrection Pascha. Also, uh, causing the definition of Easter as a Jewish Passover to become obsolete, as the Oxford Dictionary would later define Easter in the multi-volume Oxford English Dictionary and also showing a secondary meaning, the Jewish Passover, in, in brackets, obsolete. Um, thus agreeing with Seville, who was an Oxford man himself and also backs up a previous article about Easter that the KJV translation ended an 86-year trend that began with Tyndale. So, one thing I just want to talk about the Oxford Dictionary. Now, if you get the Encyclopedia Britannica and you look up Trinitarianism or the Trinity, the first words it says is, the Trinity is a doctrine not found in the Bible. <laughs> it's like, oh, who wrote this? A Jehovah's Witness? And so when we're looking at the Oxford Dictionary, now, I say there that the second meaning is the Jewish Passover was made obsolete. Um, one of the definitions in the Oxford Dictionary is that Easter actually just means um, Passover. They're sort of like synonyms. Um, now, I believe they were for a time. Now, Tyndale invented them. Um, he attempted to sort of you know, make Passover the Old Testament word, but you know, he got killed. And so then other people were sort of juggling these words around. It wasn't until the King James guys came along and said, okay, that's an Old Testament word, Passover. Easter is a New Testament word, and so we'll just use it like that. It wasn't until that happened, you know, 86 years later, that it really got defined. And during that time, they were synonymous because you, you find both of those words being used all over the place in, in translations. 
And so, um, basically, I think the Oxford Dictionary is wrong to say that they are basically just synonymous and that's it. The King James Version made them not synonymous. And that's clear by just defining how they defined Easter in their preface. They defined Easter as, you know, they didn't once use the word Passover um, for any of these Easter holidays in their preface. They used Easter. So by the 1611, they had categorised these two words. Um, so Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Now I'm just going to quickly go to the third article. Um, see if there's anything I can glean from that. Uh, part three is here. Oops. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so I gave my first Easter article to David Crystal, world leading expert on the English language. Uh, he gave me some pointers, um, and it's German connection mentioned that the article was accurate and good. Um, although both slightly disagreeable on certain minor points, Christianity Today has since published a similar article on Easter being Christian and not pagan. Also, Jonathan, Jonathan Safati of um, Creation Ministries International, he's used the information to confirm my stance on Easter. Uh, when I approached James White of Alpha and Omega Ministries, who wrote the book King James Only Controversy, he speedily rebuked me and called me a Ruckmanite for making such claims and banned me from his forum. On the flip side, D.A. Waite, who wrote Defending the King James Bible, printed parts of the articles in his newsletter after having formally taught that Easter was pagan. His contemporary, Jack Mormon, also read the articles and said that the information had taken the matter forward considerably from his former article on the topic. So can you see you know, teachable people and non-teachable people? Um, you know, send it to D.A. Waite. He's like, man, this is good information. You know, he runs through with it. Jack Mormon's like, yeah, this is good. You know, it runs through with it. Um, you know, send it to James White. He's just like, Rackmanite. <laughs> it's just, and people wonder why we mock this guy. You know, and this has been going on for years and years and years. And so, um, unfortunately, what was happening in the King James only circles, people were actually thinking that Easter was a pagan festival. And they were thinking, well, the King James is right everywhere else except for this Easter bit. Um, but maybe they actually knew that it was a pagan thing and so they translated it as Easter instead of Passover because it's, it's a pagan in festival and, and so for some reason they did that. You know, it's just pretty messed up. And so um, unfortunately a lot of KJV guys ran with that. I know uh, Waite and Mormon did, uh, Ruckman, Gip, Ripplinger. But you know, most of these people, once I've shown this, them this information, they go with that. You know, so it's just um, because they don't really have the answers in it. But if you simply go to Google Translate, okay, if you type into um, yeah, the English side of it, um, if you translate from English into Greek and just type in Easter and Passover, okay, you'll get the Greek word Pascha, Pascha. Because we have two words, the Greeks have one. That's pretty basic, okay. Um, one... Um, Pascha, the Passover, it's the Old Testament type, and the other Pascha, Easter, is the New Testament fulfillment. So this has been the same in Greek for 2,000 years. They haven't been speaking Swahili in um, yeah, Greek circles. They've been speaking Greek for thousands of years. They've got monasteries and you know, manuscripts, and we still look at all Greek. And you know, But many times, you know, people like James White, they just redefine. It's a, oh, it's a, you know, Pascha um, yeah, only means Passover. No, if you actually um, look at the modern day meaning of Pascha, it means Easter. And so they call Easter Pascha in the whole of Greece. Shows you how illiterate James White is. He's supposed to be a Greek expert. He has no idea. Um, okay, so we went through it before, but you know, I'll just say it again. See, what I believe happened was people were looking through all the writings of early English people. They found Bede, which is in 750 or whatever. He's mentioned, well, you know, this month of the spring could have been named after Yosta. So what you had in dictionary um, uh, listings, you had probably Easter 
and then you had this other one, Yosta, and then you had, you know, other, you know, East is a direction, and, you know, um, you know, other words related to East, and then it will go through like a normal dictionary. So what happened after a while is people started to view Easter and Yosta as the same category, and they started to pronounce them the same and say, oh, B was saying Easter. No, he was saying Yosta. It's E-O-S-T-R-E. It's totally different. But no, he's saying Easter. So it's like, okay. So then these became separate, um, you know, subcategories in a sense where you've got, you know, the word Easter, then you go, okay, it's a resurrection celebration. And then you got um, definition number two, it's a pagan thing. So then people are just, you know, who don't know how to use a dictionary, they just sort of mix these two up and they're gone, Easter is a pagan thing. And that's pretty much what's happened with Alexander Hislop. And so um, so we can look back and say the 1717 dictionary states that Easter is Aosta, Usta, a Saxon goddess whose feast they observed in Easter month, April. Now remember that information only comes from one guy in um, 1750, who got rebuked for um, putting pagan names on everything. Um, but then it also has below this definition has Easter, the Christian Passover, a remembrance of Christ's death and resurrection. So that's Alicia Coles' 1717 dictionary. And so if you go through Noah Webster's dictionary, it's pretty much the same. It talks about, you know, um, Easter is a goddess of the spring and da 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 but then it will have um, another meaning is that it's Easter is um, yeah, the resurrection celebration and so people have just become confused because most of the time they don't know how to read these uh, dictionary listings and um, there's also the confusion of things sounding alike so um, like I went through stalk, it's a, it's part of a plant, or to stalk or follow her and harass a, a person. They're not related words. They sound the same. It's called homophones. They sound the same, but they're not. Left, which I've left the building, is not left opposite to right. They're totally different words. Uh, rose, like a flower, and rose, the past tense of rise. Jesus rose from the dead. Doesn't mean he became a rose, you know, and Words such as carrot, C-A-R-A-T, or carrot, C-A-R-E-T, and carrot that a bunny rabbit would eat, C-A-R-R-O-T, they all sound the same, but they're not related. Um, or two, T-O, two, T-W-O, or T, um, double O, two, uh, they're all the same, and they all sound the same. So we have Easter and Yosta, these two words that became sort of blurred and now if you ask people they say easter is a pagan festival and christians are just i've seen footage of christians having an easter festival you know and i know the whole bunny bunny thing is just you know what's that got to do with anything but what's santa claus got to do with it it's like nearly everything that's any type of celebration by a christian is just usurped and and you know, imagine doing that to one of the celebrations of just a secular thing, like Anzac Day, just turning up and I'm bamboozu the clown and I'm I'm on a unicycle and tooting my horns and I'm selling Anzac badges or whatever, but it's like, you know, or imagine at the minute silence, you know, I just rock up there and like, eh, 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 hey guys, you know, and they would just say that's just so sacrilege, you know. But, you know, anything can happen on a, on a Christian Day celebration and it doesn't matter, you know. But um, unfortunately... You know, I saw this one woman and, and she had a megaphone and she's screaming at this church, you guys are involved in a pagan festival, a pagan festival. People get really angry about this sort of stuff. And, and so, you know, when I'm online, I say, you know, Easter is a 100% Christian festival. <laughs> it's nothing to do with paganism whatsoever. Um, they can get quite upset. And there's many verses that talk about um, the dawn or sunrise or the rising of the sun. And so... Um, you know, Matthew 28 one says at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to the sepulchre. Um, Mark 16.2, it says, And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. Um, uh, some scriptures point to Christ's resurrection being a great dawning. Malachi 5.2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the sun, that's S-U-N, the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. 
uh, Second Peter one nineteen says, "We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts." It's, it's a, the day dawn and the day star. It's it's the sun, and so um, it's talking about Jesus. Jesus said, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. What's the morning star? It's the sun. Um, so, I mean, you know, to basically, you've got the whole connection of Alexander Hyssop says, Easter is Ishtar, okay, this goddess. Um, that just came into English, German, and Teutonic language somehow, just by magic, you know. And they started worshipping this goddess, you know, that's over in Phoenicia. And then you've got this, you know, reference of bead, you know, to this goddess. And so what Hislop's done is put this all together and created this conspiracy theory that James White believes. And so, um, yeah, at the end of the day, the word ost or ost uh, is the same as the English word east. It's not related to a pagan thing or a Christian thing. It's completely neutral. It's a direction. It's like saying west. We wouldn't say like west. I just say there was a goddess called the Western um, Witch. Okay, would that make anything related to the term West evil, like West Minister, or um, you know, there's places in Germany called Usterberg. You know, a berg just simply means a, a town or a city, and Uster means eastern. So, eastern city, Usterberg. Um, you know, Westminster, Southampton, these are just directions, you know. Um, and so, people are totally rejecting Easter because of phonetics, because something sounds the same as something else. And because one guy said that it could be. Um, April might be named after this um, goddess. And I even go into that in my third article. I say, okay, let's just pretend that that did happen. Let's just give the benefit of the doubt and we'll say, look, uh, okay, maybe the English people had a whole you know, period of in the spring called Easter and it was a, a pagan goddess. But obviously they totally usurped that and made it a Christian thing which is exactly what they did with the Greek language. It was totally pagan, and they used concepts of hell and, um, um, uh, you know, theos, and, and um, I mentioned a few earlier, but um, they were totally pagan, and that they used them to write the Christian scriptures. How come we can't steal something and just, you know, why does it always have to keep that definition? We've made it holy. We've, we've stolen it, you know. But I don't even think that happened. But that's the worst case scenario is we've Christianized a pagan thing, a pagan word. <laughs> and it's like, so anyway, I'll just read it one more time and then we'll wrap up. Um, James White. He says... One might well include the King James Version's unusual rendering. It's not unusual. It was put in by design. It was um, put in because it is the only place where it is a post-resurrection Pascha. Uh, every other of the um, 29 uh, instances or the 28 instances are the Old Testament Passover. And it's describing that. So it's not unusual. Um Rendering of Acts 12, 4 as more of a mistranslation. How could these guys mistranslate? And that's the thing. He makes out the, the King James Version has mistranslations all over it. I think I've just proved to you that it's not a mistranslation. It was put in by design. It's more of a mistranslation than an ambiguous reading. Rendering, sorry. And it would be hard to argue, given the facts. What facts? That what um, they knew the English language well, they knew the German language well, they knew English history way better than knew James White, they knew um, all the Bible versions of that era better than you do James White, they knew of all the the um, German commentaries, they knew of Beza's writings, they knew of Calvin's writing. you know, James White might not have read, he might have read Calvin, but it's like these guys... They would have read all that stuff. These guys were experts. 
these guys were expert translators. I, I, I wouldn't trust James. You know, he always says monogenes means unique, one of a kind. It, it, show me the translations that have that. They're very, very few, and they're not really popular. And so he keeps saying this sort of stuff. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, who would I put my trust in? You know, and just look at the forward of the King James. They use Easter all the time in that, and it means exactly what the King James translators meant it to mean later on. And it's like, it's. Uh, uh, I wonder if James White would do a similar article and say, well, all the beginning of the King James Bible, when it says the table to find Easter forever, it's talking about the pagan festival. It's talking about the goddess. He wouldn't say something like that, but... He's prepared to say it about scripture. You know, <laughs> these guys are just attacking the word of God um, and their scholarship is absolutely hopeless. So anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed that and got a bit of an education about Easter. God bless and I'm going to bail now and I'll hopefully uh, chat to you um, soon. Okay.